So uh, I love it when people set expectations low. <laughs> but I do, actually, this was all planned because I also love having standing room only crowds. It boosts my ego, so this, this, this is good. So for the last 250 years, the world has been running an experiment. And this is the experiment. We tried all kinds of social, political, economic systems. We tried as close as anybody's ever come to capitalism, to real freedom. We tried all the way over to communism. And we've tried everything in between. Some freedom, lots of statism, some statism, a lot of freedom, all the different variations in between. We've been trying this not just in any specific geographic area, We've been trying this globally, tried it in Europe, in Americas, South America, in Asia. It's an ongoing, seemingly, experiment. And the results are in. Indeed, the results have been in for a very long time. And the results are very simple. If you care about human life expectancy, if you care about wealth, if you care about prosperity, if you care about the poor, if you care about the standard of living of the poor, then capitalism works. It's by far the best system. Economically, it derives, it creates the most wealth. It raises up people from poverty faster and to greater heights than any other system. It provides for the kind of medical technology that allows us to live longer and live better. And indeed, you can actually plot this on a graph. You can create a graph of the extent to which people have economic freedom and the wealth, the economic success, the standard of living. And there's a strong correlation between the two. The more freedom, the more economic freedom, the more capitalism people have, the better life is. And this is true historically. It's true across all these various geographies. It's about human beings. It's not about the West or the East or the South or the North. It's about the nature of man. What we're like as human beings and what systems work for us and what systems don't work for us. And you can see this historically. And I'm going to give some quick examples because the core of my Talk tonight is not economic or historic, but moral. But take a quick example. 300 years ago, what percentage of the world's population was poor? <laughs> like 99%. Everybody was poor. A few aristocrats up here. And everybody was poor. Everywhere. There's a wonderful graph that shows uh, Income per capita or wealth per capita, it doesn't really matter. Throughout human history, so it started, I don't know, minus 10,000 BC, it doesn't matter, right? And this is the graph, right? It goes like this. It fluctuates a little bit, like Rome is a little bit up and then the Dark Ages, it's a little bit down, but generally it's flat and flat and flat and flat, and then it goes like that. I mean, like that. And then in Asia, it does something different. It continues to go flat, and then it goes like that. And what is the what is the, that turning point? And that turning point is very recent. In Western Europe and America, what is the date in which wealth goes like that? Income per capita goes like that. Industrial Revolution. Yeah, I like 1776. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, two reasons, not just the one you think. One is the establishment of America, the first really free country established on the principles of freedom, even if not carried out consistently, but the principles were the principles of freedom, which sets in motion the real flourishing of the Industrial Revolution and the flourishing of capitalism. But the second is, a book is published in 1776. Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith, the first book advocating for a market economy, if you will, in a you know, semi-consistent way, not completely consistent, but not bad for 1776. Those two events, and then you see it go like that. Now in Asia, that didn't happen. When does it happen in Asia? <coughs> yes, yeah, sometime 
in the, in the 70s and early 80s. Suddenly, what do they do? They adopt market economics. And since over the last 30 years, based on UN numbers, not cooked by any right-wing <laughs> organization, 800 million, 800, look at this up, 800 million people have come out of poverty in Asia. 800 million people. Why? I mean, nobody doubts this. Because of market economics adopted by the Chinese, etc. There, by India, which turned away from socialism in the in the early 1990s, by South Korea, by Taiwan, by all these countries. So you get the same thing, right? So you know, there's a pattern here. And again, you can see this cross sectionally. You can look at East Berlin, East Germany, West Germany before the wall came down. You know, they built that wall. I have to tell students this because they don't necessarily know. But they built the wall not to protect, right? Not to prevent West Germans from fleeing into East Germany. <laughs> the difference when the wall came down between East Germany and West Germany, between Eastern Europe and West Germany, was unbelievable. Nobody realized how bad things were under communism, under statism, under those kind of policies. Not only were they poor, it was filthy. It was the most dirty place on the planet. Why? Because you take care of your own property. Where there's private property, there's cleanliness. Where everything's owned by the state, nobody takes care of it. Which communism proved. So you got these cross-sectional, you got these examples. One of my favorite is Hong Kong. I don't know how many people here have ever been to Hong Kong. Anybody been to Hong Kong? I always say, you gotta go once in your life. Because it's an astounding place. Hong Kong 70 years ago was a fishing village. There was nothing there. It's a rock. There's no natural resources. There's nothing in Hong Kong. And yet, today, 7.5 million people live on that rock. The GDP per capita, which is a measure of wealth, is equal to that of the United States. People escape from all over Asia in little rafts, in little boats. Some of them swam. Some of them jumped the fence over in China and risked their lives to get to Hong Kong. Why? What did Hong Kong offer them? No safety net. No socialized health care. No social security. But it offered them freedom. It offered them the rule of law. It offered property rights protection. And that's it. And they made something of it. They started with literally nothing. Nothing. Dirt poor. And they built one of the most successful countries, cities, in human history. <laughs> with freedom, with property rights, contract law. They couldn't even vote. That's, those are, that's the recipe, you guys. That's capitalism. That's free markets. It works wherever it's tried. Whenever it's tried, it works. And yet, and yet, we're all turning our backs on it. We have been for 100 years. We're rejecting capitalism. We're rejecting it theoretically. We're rejecting it in practice. For 100 years, at least in the US and in Europe, we have eroded the level of economic freedom dramatically. Every decade, it doesn't matter if Republican, conservative, Democrat, middle of the road, they're all anti-capitalist, all of them. Every decade, you get more regulations, more controls, more taxes, more complex taxes. Complexity is great for statists. It allows them to control you. Because then it allows you to give some people loopholes and other people not, and play the favoritism game, which politicians love to do. <coughs> but every decade, it doesn't matter again, right? If you look at government spending, it grows. It doesn't matter if Ronald Reagan's in office. It doesn't matter if George Bush and either one of them is in office. They grow. Right? Republicans maybe cut taxes once in a while, but they never cut regulation. And they never, ever, ever, ever cut government spending. Indeed, George Bush, the last George Bush, increased government spending more than any Democrat has since Lyndon Johnson. So-called cowboy. Uh, 
So what's going on? Why is it? And this is true, by the way, not just in the U.S. If you look at Europe, Europe has turned it back on capitalism in dramatic fashion, has been doing so, again, systematically since the teens, since before World War, since after World War I, and in dramatic fashion since the 1960s. So if I'm right, which granted for some of you is still a gift, <laughs> that's okay. You know, that's what two days are for to challenge me on this. <laughs> if I'm right that capitalism indeed produces the goods, creates the wealth, makes it possible for people to be successful, increases the standard of living of the poor and of everybody, why do we turn our backs on? I mean, it doesn't make any sense, right? Because what we really care about is standard of living, is wealth, is being prosperous, is being successful. And yet, at every single opportunity, we turn our back on. And of course, I know it, 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 we're told that capitalism is unstable and creates all these crises and everything. Like the recent one, right? The, the, the financial crisis, we said, the, the headline, for what? Capitalism. capitalism failed. And of course, the headlines came out before anybody, anybody had studied any of the data. Nobody actually knew what happened, but we knew. We knew. Because we know that every crisis is caused by whom? Capitalists, but who in particular are capitalists? Bankers. Bankers are the devil. <laughs> Always. God, human history. We hate bankers more than anybody else, and I'll tell you at the end what. It's kind of funny to me that anybody would blame the financial crisis on free markets, because that assumes a mythology, a mythology that says that in 2007, Banking in the United States was a free market. <laughs> in 2007, banking was the most regulated industry in the United States. Every decision a bank made had to be approved by a regulator. Every bank in the United States was regulated by at least five regulatory agencies. At least. Today, it's seven because Dodd-Frank added two. And that's the way to solve the problem is to add more. Not even, not even add more power to one regulator, just add more regulated, regulatory agencies. So every every regulatory agency fine, right? So this isn't a free market. Uh, housing, mortgage industry, free, Freddie, Fannie, government entities control the mortgage markets. So whatever you blame the financial crisis on, and I'm happy to discuss this with anybody, <laughs> it can't be free markets because they want it. They haven't been free markets in banking or. In, or in, uh, in mortgages or any of this stuff since the 1930s, and really in banking since the since 1914 when the Federal Reserve was established. So what's going on here? What is it that's so so uh, upsetting about capitalism, about free markets that we can't tolerate? It, that we turn our backs to it? That we reject it time and time again? That every crisis we blame on those evil capitalists? What is evil about? Them? So let's go to what capitalism is really about. Right? So what's capitalism really about? What, what, make it even simpler. What, what are markets about? Bottom line. Trade and voluntary trade. Okay, voluntary trade, but why do we trade? So, so you know, some of you have seen this. Right? It's an iPhone. Why does Bill, what? Bill Gates, why does Steve Jobs, <laughs> that's my next example, right? why does Steve Jobs build these? To make money, right? He builds this to make money. That's not only about money, right? What else? Passion. Passion. He loves this stuff, right? He wants to see his vision created in reality. It's a beautiful creation, right? Who's passion? Steve Jobs. Right. Who's money? Steve Jobs. So who's this about? Steve. Steve. Steve made an iPhone for Steve. Well, it's partner <laughs> <laughs> So. When, when we produce stuff, when we build stuff, when we create stuff, we're doing it in our own self -interest. We're doing it for ourselves. And I like to say, you know, I, put, I bought my first iPhone uh, in 2008 when it first came out, and the economy was spiraling out of control, and I went and I bought my iPhone because I wanted to help stimulate the US economy. Because <laughs> <laughs> I know, that's why all of you go shopping in the mall. You go shopping you care about your fellow man. 
<laughs> and you want to make sure they're jobs, and you want to make sure that they are, that, you know, they have an income, and after all, we're a consumer-driven economy, we are told. So you're just trying to do your shit, right? <laughs> I'm not going to ask how many of you actually do that, <laughs> because there's always one. But anyway. <laughs> No, why do you go shopping? Yeah, to make your life better. Because you want to be cool, because you want to be more productive, because you want to look nice, because whatever. It's about you. The marketplace is a place where producers and consumers meet in the pursuit of their own self-interest. The marketplace is about self-interest. It's not about Maximizing social utility. It's not about making the world a better place. It's about the pursuit of self-interest. And this is not a new observation. Adam Smith wrote in The Wealth of Nations, he says, he says, the baker doesn't bake the bread because he cares about you. <laughs> you know, they didn't have iPhones there, so he had to eat bread. Exactly. <laughs> he bakes the bread because he's trying to make a living for himself. He's making the bread for himself, to feed himself and his family and the people who live with him, the people he loves. He's not doing it out of a sense for you. And the grocer doesn't sell you the bread because he cares about you. He's selling the bread because he's trying to make a living. And he, these things, you know how, what the profit margin on this stuff is? I mean, if Steve cared about me, it would be a lot cheaper. So, the marketplace is a place where we pursue ourselves. But what are we taught from when we're this big about self interest? Oh, bad. I mean, I grew up in a good Jewish household, right? <laughs> My mother was a good Jewish mother, and she taught me, Iran, think of yourself last, think of others first, be self less. Now, granted, she didn't mean any of that. No mother ever does. <laughs> but that's part of the trick. We have a moral code that we advocate for even though we don't live it. Because my mother wanted me to be successful like every mother does. And, you know, to be successful, guess who you have to place first? Yourself. At least to some extent, right? But we are brought up with a morality that says... Selflessness is good. Selflessness is virtue. Sacrifice is noble. And let's just be clear about what sacrifice means. Because it's good, it's good to define term, right? When I buy an iPhone for 400 bucks, am I sacrificing $400 for the iPhone? No. No, what am I doing? I'm trading. I'm giving $400 and getting an iPhone. And how much is the iPhone worth to me if I'm willing to give up $400? Or is this $400? Oh, you guys are studying economics. <laughs> <laughs> usually I hear $400, and that's wrong. It's more than $400. You wouldn't bother, you wouldn't bother to exchange the $400 if it was worth the same. The reason you do it is for you it's worth more. And I have to tell you, my iPhone is worth a lot more than $400. <laughs> and, you know, think about the products you buy. Some are, some aren't. But you don't buy them unless you intend for that product to be more valuable to you than the money you've given up. So trade, voluntary trade is win-win. I won because I got an iPhone instead of $400. There were a bunny hole in my pocket, right? And Apple won because it made a profit. So trade is win-win. Now what's sacrifice? Sacrifice is giving and expecting one in return. Nothing or something less valuable. See, this is getting a little uncomfortable, right? If we're talking about morality. <laughs> Sacrifice is giving and expecting nothing in return, or expecting something of less value in return. Because if you expect something of more value in return, it's trading. So we've been taught from when we're this bit that morality to be good is to sacrifice, not to trade. It's to sacrifice, it's to not think of yourself, it's to think of others first. And we can think of examples when you think in your mind about great moral heroes, about people who are noble, who are morally good. Steve Jobs' name doesn't pop up. <laughs> or even worse, Bill Gates' name doesn't pop up. 
And you have to think about Bill Gates. Bill Gates built a company called Microsoft. He sold us all products. I don't know, 100 bucks a pop or whatever. How much of those products worked to us if we paid 100? More, More than 100. So our lives better or worse off having bought Microsoft? Better. better. So he made all of our lives better. Indeed, I would argue that you know, he, he touched almost any human being on the planet. Who hasn't been touched by Microsoft? We standardized. The internet would not be the internet today without Microsoft. Bill Gates changed the world. He helped millions and millions, actually billions of people. He made the world a better place in a profound, deep sense. How much moral credit does he get for any of that? Zero. Well, actually, some negative. Why? Because he did the bastard to make money at the same time. <laughs> and a lot of them. I mean, if he made just a little bit, we forgive him. But he made, <laughs> he made like $70 billion for himself. $70 billion. Now, how much, wealth, how much wealth did he create out there? Trillions. But he made 50. He improved the lives of most of humanity. But he benefited from it, so that doesn't count. When does Bill Gates become a good guy in our minds? <laughs> when he starts a foundation. Not only does he start a foundation, he leaves Microsoft. So God forbid he's not doing anything self-interested anymore. He's not producing wealth. He's not employing people. He's not creating value. Now he just does the foundation. He's giving back as if he took it. I hate giving back because give back assumes that you took. What did you take? You created. Businesses create. They don't redistribute. They create. The wealth that Bill Gates has didn't exist before in some hidden corner that he stole. He created it. Didn't exist before. So now he's become a good guy, right? He's giving his money away and, and notice that, you know, we can't have Bill Gates giving his money away in Seattle where he might benefit from it. That might be too self-interested. He has to go all the way to Africa to give his money away as if there are no problems in Seattle. <laughs> I know if you ever watched the TV series The Killing, it's pretty dark. But there are a lot of problems in Seattle, a lot of problems in Seattle. He could have invested there. No, he has to go all the way to Africa. I'm sure what he's doing is going to benefit a lot of people. But you know what? It will benefit a fraction, a fraction of the people that Microsoft helped by making the 50 billion. He changed the world in far more profound ways at Microsoft than he ever will do through his philanthropy. Yet in Microsoft, he gets zero to negative credit. In philanthropy, oh, he's okay. Now he's not a, he's not a saint yet, right? We don't we don't think of him as a moral hero for being a philanthropist. Be quiet. Well, there are two reasons. One, he seems like he's enjoying himself. <laughs> Think about all the people that you associate with moral heroism. The whole point of moral heroism, heroism is to suffer. Sacrifice means misery. Sacrifice means suffering. The idea of being, you know, enjoying oneself, that is suspect. Moral. <laughs> Based on the code we live on. And the second is, he's still really, really rich. <laughs> so how would we make him a saint? I haven't talked to the popes. I don't, can't guarantee this. But Bill Gates to become a real moral hero, streets named after him, you know, statues built for him. You'd have to give it all away, move into a tent, and if you could trust a little bit of blood, <laughs> that would be good. That's what we admire. That's what the moral code that we live with demands. Now that moral code is incompatible with Microsoft. It's incompatible with economic freedom. It's incompatible with a marketplace where people are pursuing self-interest. So of course, whenever there's a crisis, whenever there's a problem, we blame the capitalists. They're self-interested and we know self-interest is bad. We've been taught that not only to be selfless is good. But what does being selfish, let's use the word, what does selfish mean? You know, the old dictionary definition used to say, taking care of self. But that's not what we mean when we point to the kid in the schoolyard and say, he's selfish. What did we mean? What do we mean by that? He's a lying, cheating SOB. <laughs> he would do anything to anybody to get his way. That's what's in our mind when we think of self-interest. 
That's what our morality has taught us for at least 2,000 years. That there are two moral codes. One moral code is care about others, selfless, sacrifice. Other people's lives are more important than yours. You have to do whatever it takes. They need is a demand on you. Their need requires your action, requires your values. You are not important. That's one moral code. The second moral code is self-interest, which means lying, cheating, and manipulating people. That's it. Those are two alternatives. Now, if those are the two alternatives, we either choose, but most of us don't want to be bad people, so we either choose sacrifice, or we choose amorality. We choose not to take morality seriously at all. But when a crisis happens, when there's a problem, who are we going to blame? Well, the bad guys. We know who the bad guys are. They're the selfish ones. Who's selfish in our economy? Businessmen. And particularly financiers. You know, kind of, this is the reason why we particularly hate finance, right? Because Bill Gates, Bill Gates has a product you can hide behind. Hey, go use wood. Look, I created this. I'm an okay guy. But what does a banker say? <laughs> There's no product. He's naked. He's right there. Now, if he was smart, he would say, Bill Gates couldn't create Microsoft enough for me, which is true. Capital comes first. Before you get jobs, before you get innovation, before you get entrepreneurship, you need capital. But that's hard. That's hard to explain. That's a, you know, you need a college course for that one, right? <laughs> Why finance works. Why it's actually productive. But they clearly, of all the different professions, nobody is more nakedly self-interested than the banker. They're about money. That's it. They're about making a profit. It's not a, there's no product to hide behind. So whenever there's a problem, we blame those people who are self-interested because we've been taught from, again, from day one, that self-interest is evil, that selflessness and sacrifice are good and noble. And as long as that's the moral code, you can explain to people how capitalism creates wealth, creates a good life, raises standard of living, and they don't care because at the core of capitalism is this immoral relationship. This immoral motivation. Because capitalism actually rewards self-interest, it encourages self-interest, it fosters self-interest. And if we believe self-interest is evil, we don't want a system like that. And people do not vote their pocketbooks. That is one of the biggest myths out there. People don't vote their economic interests. If they did, we would be living in laissez-faire capitalist heaven. People vote what they think is right, what they think is just, what they think is moral. And you see this in some simple examples you can do. But so, uh, you know, eight of the ten richest counties in the last election voted for a president who promised to raise taxes on them. And they voted for him. In California, we had a proposition. So we all got to vote on whether to raise taxes on the rich, anybody above $250,000. I mean, a lot. Raise taxes by 30%, from 10 to 13%. State income tax. How do you think the rich voted? They voted for it. Of course they voted for it. Right? My favorite example, and you, know, and you can ask me about the Q&A, because I don't want to try to explain the whole thing. But if you look at minimum wage, as an economist, not as a political thing, but just a pure economist, Take Paul Krugman. You know Paul Krugman? Right? Yeah. When, Paul, when Paul Krugman, a long time ago, when Paul Krugman was actually an economist, <laughs> <laughs> he wrote the textbook on economics, which has a chapter on the minimum wage. And the chapter is brilliant. It shows that the minimum wage is unbelievably destructive to the poorest of the poor, to unskilled young laborers, that it creates unemployment among them, that it raises prices for the poor because they're the consumers of the products and employ minimum wage people, and that the minimum wage makes no, zero economic sense. And you can show this with supply and demand curves, it's very easy to do. And you can teach that in economics classes, I've done. And everybody will get an A on the test, and then you ask them, are you for minimum wage? And everybody will raise their hand. Because it feels good. I'm helping the poor. Oh, I'm not helping the poor. But it feels like I'm helping the poor, and that's good enough. 
And you know what? If you have to sacrifice some poor people to other poor people, that's okay too. Because sacrifice is good. <laughs> so, this is not a battle about economics. In my view, we won, those of us who believe in capitalism, won the economic battle a long time ago. We had some great economies. Hayek and Mises and Friedman and Menger and a bunch of them. And there's no shortage even today of good free market economists. We won that up. It doesn't matter. If we truly believe that it's an evil economic system because of the incentives it provides, because of the way people behave, because of what it rewards, we'll never have capitalism. We'll turn our backs on it over and over and over again. And this is, I think, Ayn Rand's real significant contribution to the entire debate about capitalism. It's to ask a very simple question about the moral code that we all take for granted. And that simple question is, why? Why must you sacrifice your life for other people? Why should you live for others? Why is your neighbor's life more important than yours, or for that matter, equal to yours? Why? And at the end of the day, there's no answer. It's always because. Because our mothers, our preachers, our philosophers taught us. But not that there's any reasonable answer. And Rand's answer is, it's not. Your life is the most important thing to you. It should be. You should cherish your life. You should live your life to the fullest. You should make the most of the one shot you have on this earth. You should be self-interested. You should celebrate your self-interest. And indeed, self-interest is not about lying, cheating, stealing, and being an SOB. None of those are self-interested strategies. If you think about the people you know who lied a lot in their lives, not huge success stories. They don't do well over the long term. Yeah. It's not a strategy for success. What is? What is the core? What is the thing that makes human life a success? What is the thing that makes human life possible? Trust. Happiness. No. Happiness. <laughs> Close. So think about think about this. You know. <laughs> no, it's gonna hang with other people. We didn't build this building by helping others. We don't have these wonderful clothes by helping others, this technology. iPhone did not come about by helping others. What created the iPhone? Well, look around you, right? Look around the people around you. We're a pretty pathetic animal. I mean, you can look. <laughs> we're slow, we're weak, we have no fangs, we have no claws. You put yourself up against a saber-toothed tiger, the saber-toothed tiger wins every day. And yet, here we are, in the comfort of this beautiful room, right, with technology all around us, and the last time I saw a saber-toothed tiger was in a natural history museum. What allowed us to survive? How did we beat the saber-toothed tiger? By using our mind. By using our mind. Corporation is a product, it's not the reason Reason is what makes it possible for us to thrive. And reason is what makes it possible for us to communicate. We create concepts and words and then communicate. We plan, we strategize. I mean, from the, from the very birth of agriculture, somebody had to figure agriculture out. Agriculture didn't just come into existence. Somebody had to figure out the relationship between a seed dropping to the ground and water being, you know, raining that day and something coming out of it. Now you all laugh. Because you learned that in kindergarten. But it was a time when human beings didn't know this. Somebody had to figure it out. And it turned out that a lot of somebody's did. Because all kinds of cultures discovered agriculture. But some individual had to figure it out. And then some individual had to figure out, okay, well, we see this causal scientific relationship. I can now turn this into an industry called agriculture. That was the Bill Gates of his time, the entrepreneur. And we probably burnt both of them at the stake for that. Because that's what we do. To people who discover new ideas. That's, the, that's human history. Right. Then they call the government. <laughs> <laughs> the government was the one doing the sacrifice. <laughs> Always was. So, what guides our life, what makes human, if you look at history, what makes human life successful 
is reason, is our mind, is our ability to think, our ability to see reality, to observe reality, understand reality, integrate reality, and reshape reality, make it fit our needs. So if you're going to be self-interested, it's not about lying, stealing, and cheating. It's about thinking. It's about using your mind. It's about pursuing your values in a rational way. And yes, that includes cooperating and helping others, working with others when it fits. And sometimes it doesn't fit. Sometimes you don't help others. But the focus is not others. The focus is you. What are the values that are necessary for me to make my life the best life it can be? And some of those relate to other people like love and relationships and friendship, which are important spiritual values that relate to other people. And some of them are material values like my wonderful iPhone. But Rand is proposing an ethical system that says self-interest is what's noble. Bill Gates is a hero for building Microsoft. We should build statues for him for that. Yes, we should. <laughs> no. You won't. <clears throat> sacrificing, sacrificing is a waste of a life. Thinking of others as a priority, that's a waste of a life. What about you? What about your life? What about your value? So what she's calling us to do is be the best that we can be as human beings. Find those values that make us, each one of us, the best human being we can do. We can be. And it reorients morality completely. It says trade, win-win, is wonderful, it's beautiful, it's noble, it's moral, it's ethical, it's good. Win-lose, which is sacrifice, sucks. Why would I want to lose when I have an option of win-win? Where both parties win. Nobody has to lose. And indeed, capitalism is a system of win-win. <coughs> that's why we hate it. Because that's not moral. Moral is win-lose. And win-lose is almost always lose-lose. Just try it in a relationship sometimes. <laughs> All the important values are self-interested values. Love. I love love. Right? Love is great. But love's not about sacrifice. Love is about recognizing in another human being the values that you admire. It's about the way that other people person makes you feel. Imagine on the, you know, just before the wedding, you go up to the person you're about to marry and say, this is a huge sacrifice for me. <laughs> <laughs> telling him, forcing him to do things he doesn't want. 
A person who's truly self-interested wants freedom. He wants to pursue his values. Whether they other people like the values or don't like the values. What did Thomas Jefferson say? If your neighbor doesn't have his hand in your pocket, what he does in his home or what he does by himself is none of your business. That's freedom. Unless he's stealing from you, unless he's attacking you, you want to be free. And you know, sometimes you'll make mistakes. That's okay. You learn from those mistakes. Or you don't. That's your problem. But you have no demands on other people. You don't sacrifice other people to you. And you don't sacrifice to other people. So a, a truly self-interested person, a morally self-interested person, wants freedom. He wants the freedom to use his mind. The enemy of reason is force. And therefore he wants to live in a society that's free. Free of force. And the only society that's free, free of force, is capitalism. <laughs> Good, I'm glad that got a laugh. Mm -hmm. um, the only society free of force, free of coercion, is capitalism. In capitalism, nobody can steal your stuff. The government doesn't have a right to your things. The government can't tell you how to live your life or not to live your life. You know, here in, 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 in Colorado, you guys really value uh, legalizing marijuana, which is great. I'm all for it. So the government has no business in what you smoke. It's true. I agree. But then why does the government have a business in what I do in my business? <coughs> the government has no business in my business. Not in my life. Not in my personal life. And not in my business life. If you really believe in freedom, then freedom. And that's what capitalism is. So capitalism is the eradication of force from human life. It's the system that is based on the idea of voluntary exchange, of trade. It's a system that leaves individuals free to pursue their own self-interested values in an attempt to make their own lives as happy and successful as they can. And in that sense, it is the only moral system. Because every other moral system, every other economic system, political system, is based on force. Every single one. It's based on redistribution of wealth, it's based on telling people what they can and cannot do, how they can and cannot do it. And it's not just telling them, right? There's a gun behind the teller. Mm -hmm. So every system, every system of statism is a system of force. So capitalism is moral because it leaves you free. Free to pursue your rational, self-interested values. It's the only system that allows you to do that, and therefore it is the only moral system. Thank you. I'd like to use a quote from your book, Free Market Revolution. Is that all right? Absolutely. It says, uh, people who believe that something is evil will not not believe it, even if you tell them it works. And as you talked to us tonight, you know, it does work. Yeah. So um, with that in mind, I always get asked as a defender of capitalism, well, yes, it may have worked in the past, but they talk about this uh, inner, this environment crisis, and of course, this is one of the more persistent uh, arguments from the opposition. And what I always say is, look, free market means just that, free to rape the earth or free to save it. And I get the same answer every time, not good enough, not good enough, we need change now. So with that in mind, my question to you, doctor, is this, is your quote right? Are they simply blind with evil in their eyes? Or do they have something to this point? Well, I mean, I, I wouldn't call anybody who disagrees with me evil. And I, that was not the intention of my quote at all. So I, I'm not calling everybody. Some of them, but not everybody. No, some definitely. Paul Cooper being one. Uh, but let me, let me challenge the whole premise of the kind of their example, right? And, and, you know, some of you won't like this, but we live in the healthiest, cleanest, best, environment the human race has ever had. Think of it. What was life expectancy before the Industrial Revolution? 39. 
39. And it, it got better in certain periods. It got up to like 42, 43. Life is amazing. Think of the life you have. I mean, I, it's my boggling to me, right? I, I got to call a lot on a plane. You remember what he used to take? Oh, you don't remember. <laughs> Walking. Right? Walking. I've seen, I've seen, you know, not most of the world, but I've seen a lot of the world. Right? I've seen inner China, and I've seen Africa, and I've seen all kinds of places in Europe, and at a cost of almost nothing to me. The quality of life is unbelievable that we have today. And you, you look at London 150 years ago. In the streets of London, yeah, they didn't have automobiles spewing stuff out. What did they have? Horses. They had horses. They had shit all over the place. <laughs> and in those days, they didn't have like a Disneyland. I don't know if you remember Disneyland, the guys who just scrape it up. Right? <laughs> that was just in the streets. Rats were everywhere. That's where we had plagues. Right? Our life is unbelievably clean. The water we drink, you open the tap and there's clean water that you can drink. The air that we breathe, it's not with the soot of smoke that we had in the caves. You think hunting gathering was fun? <laughs> brutal, brutal life. Horrible life. We have a great, we should be celebrating the environment for human beings. Now, if you're a spotted owl, you know, maybe not. But I'm not a spotted owl, and neither are you. <laughs> for human beings, this is the best time ever to be alive. Ever. From an environment perspective or any perspective. Well, there's certain cultural culturally there were periods that were better there, from many perspectives. So first I'd say what crisis? What are we talking about? Oh, it's getting warmer. Okay, well, you know what? We have air conditioning. <laughs> <laughs> it's unbelievable. It's pretty amazing. Right? Life is really comfortable. So what they want to do is stop industrial progress so that the cooling, the warming stops. So take a poor kid in Africa, right? Take a, who they claim, who, who, who the left claims to care about, right? There's a poor kid in Africa, he lives in a hut today with no air conditioning, it's 90 degrees outside. Life is brutal. If they industrialize Africa, which would require huge amounts of CO2 emissions, to industrial labs Africa. He will live in a house with air conditioning. And it might be, let's assume they're right, and the temperatures goes up a whopping four degrees, and now it's 94, 95 degrees. What do you prefer? 90 degrees in a hut or 95 degrees with air conditioning? Who has no question? You'll take the air conditioning. That's ridiculous. It's not ridiculous, it's true. What the, what the global warming agenda is amounts to is making sure that Africa is poor forever. Forever. You think you can replace all this energy with solar and wind? Give me a break. That's a joke. You know the cement that it took to build this thing? You know how much oil goes into producing cement? There's no way you're going to replace all that in our lifetimes or our children's lifetimes with solar and wind. When you deny people the ability to produce energy with CO2, you're denying the ability to rise out of poverty. Why is China so polluted? Because they're rising out of poverty. When you rise out of poverty, there's pollution. When you get to the middle class, you start cleaning your act up. But it takes time. And if you put all the resources into having a clean environment before you've risen out of poverty, you'll never rise. You'll never rise. So, the whole way in which the debate is framed is wrong. Now, most environmental problems, most environmental problems are sold with private property. Because private property, people who own it, keep it clean. And this is about cleanliness. So if we had private property over rivers, the water would be clean. If you had defined private property over other parts of what we today view as the commons, they would be clean. The problem today is, it doesn't belong to anybody. So there's no environmental disaster, one. And second, the solution to these problems is private power. So more freedom. Yes. I have a question. How what percentage of Bill Gates Foundation is from Warren Buffett from the West? Yeah. 
I don't know. It's going to be a high percentage because when Warren Buffett dies, all of it goes to the foundation. Well, that's my answer. Right? Yeah. Come on, create this destruction capitalism. Yes, yeah, so capitalism is this concept of creative destruction, which was defined by Schumpeter, the, the, the Austrian economist. And the idea there is that part of capitalism inevitably means that new technologies replace old technology. And new technologies rise up and the old technologies die. And, and of course, you know, there, there are plenty of examples of this, but one of the ones I like is, uh, I don't know how many of you attach to uh, uh, buggies, horse buggies, right? When, when, the, when the automobile industry came about, the horse buggy industry was wiped out. Right? And people had to re retool and learn new skills. But what happened to the standard of living of America? Went up dramatically because automobiles are far more efficient, far more productive than horse and buggies. And actually cleaner when you take into account the proof of the horses. So, creative destruction is an ongoing process that happens all the time. Right? Um, I'm trying to think of a company that's gone bankrupt recently. Kodak. Kodak. Kodak's a great example, right? Right? Film. Right? There was film. All of us bought those Kodak films, right? And, 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 it's, and Kodak didn't adapt to digital. And it's, how was the last time you saw anything by Kodak, right? They're gone. They, they, they make little digital cameras, but they're not significant anymore. They used to be one of the biggest companies in the world. Now they're insignificant. That's the kind of Polaroid. Remember Polaroid? Right? That's, the kind, that's what creative destruction means. And it's beautiful. Right? In my view, it's a beautiful process because it's a process of continuous enhancement, continuously getting better. Right? If somebody comes up with something better than this, Apple will decline. Right? But we'll be better off because we'll have something better than this. And that's cool. DIA, 10, 20 years. Yeah. I think you're... <clears throat> To me, it seems you're uh, addressing everything in kind of Coke and Pepsi terms. And you're not talking about any of the nuance. Um, for example, longer life doesn't necessarily mean better life. <coughs> sort of thing. Um, and there are capitalists, many, many capitalists, who do not give you back in return a, a fair trade. For example, uh, a dentist. If, if I need a root canal, it should not cost me fifteen hundred dollars or two thousand dollars. We do something about side of health care. Just, just you can't just, find anybody to do it cheaper. There's no choice. What and because you know, I pay fifteen hundred dollars for a root canal, my dentist drives around in a Ferrari. Okay, you're not addressing that. You're not also addressing the fact that big government or small government. We've never ever once had an honest government. So that if we had an honest government. It would, I think people would want it to be huge, but government doesn't do uh, too much. It does too many of the wrong things. So we don't know, we don't have anything to gauge what government should be. It's so never been what it's supposed to be. I mean, you don't you get to any of it. So, so, three, so, so you got three right. things. One was, uh, you don't always get a return. What was the first thing you mentioned? Longer life. Longer life being better, and the third being a modest government. So one, um, I'll take longer life any day, and then it's my responsibility to make it better. Wait, so you want 39. Me, you want 30, to be kept alive so you can lay there in your 39, room. I would have been dead 14 years ago. I've had fun the last 14 years. I've had a blast the last 14 years, and I tend to have another blast another 30 years. Longer life, properly pursued, rationally pursued, is wonderful and a better life. Now, if I'm hooked to a machine in the last six months of my life, do I want to be hooked to a machine? No. Disconnect me, please. Right? But that's that's the last six months. We're talking about a massive extension of quality. But you know, I you know what's going to happen life. in those last six months. Those people that have you hooked up to that machine are going to drain everything that you've saved and worked for, so that your family has nothing. Not true, to because I absolutely I, true. Not true, because I'm rational. So I I've written up a little contract that says. That they don't have a right to keep me on the machine, and my wife is going to disconnect it. Or whoever I hear it. Has the because to pay a lawyer to write right. up that contract. Please do it. And by the way, the only reason you hooked up to that machine for six months is because the government is paying it. Because Medicare pays for all of that. If it was your money, you would want them to unplug it. And that's what it should be. It should be your money paid for your health care, not some third party. <laughs> I mean, the root canal, how much is a root canal worth to you? 
guys. How many, is, how many of you have had really, really, really bad toothache? 1500 bucks is a bargain. <laughs> it gets rid of the pain. I'll give you 1500 bucks any day. Now, I have had root canals much cheaper than that, partially because, again, I had the foresight maybe to buy insurance. Good thing. And if the government wasn't involved in the insurance markets, if the government didn't regulate, didn't mandate, didn't uh, legislate insurance, then insurance would be dirt cheap. Mm -hmm. Dirt cheap insurance in a, in a free market costs much less than a cell phone bill on a monthly basis. Everybody could afford it. And if you had health insurance, it wouldn't cost you 1500 bucks. It costs you a $25 uh, copay or whatever. But even the 1500 bucks is worth it given the pain of payment. And I'm happy that the dentist has a Ferrari. I enjoy the fact that he has a Ferrari. He's eliminated pain for lots of people. Good for him. What is more valuable than eliminating pain? Last but not government. Government is, as George Washington said profoundly, government is force. What government is is a gun. That's what it is. Government is about coercion. When you give people guns, when you give people the power to coerce, what's the probability that they're going to stay honest? Zero. What's the probability when you tell them, here's the guns, and you can do anything you want with them? Because they know there's no limitation on government, right? We want big government because you're honest. There's no way they're going to stay on. There's no way to regulate all of our behaviors in an appropriate way. What's appropriate? The government doesn't know my values. It's going to tell me what drugs I can use. It's going to tell me what business I can start. It's going to tell me what who I should marry, maybe play to it like that, right? No. I can be the only, I'm the only one who knows what my values are. Government is a gun. So the only appropriate function for government is the only appropriate function for a gun, which is what? Self-defense. The government is there to protect us against crooks, criminals, terrorists, foreign invaders, and leave us alone otherwise. And by the way, we've never had a government like that either. But that's the government where we would be most free and most prosperous and most happy. So what pattern that I'm noticing is that the smallest governments become the largest. And this happens as a result of this value. Right? So the value that's created as a result of capitalism goes into making a large government over time. And since these values are not passed on from generation to generation, it gets forgotten and that most of the humans in there. We just sort of found it later. And so what is going to prevent what you're proposing from just turning back into the same situation where we have this? Well, because you're not identifying the cause of it. And in you my view, repeat your question. Right? Yeah, the question is. <clears throat> Governments seem, they, they, they maybe start out small, like the U.S. government in the 19th century was pretty small. It spent about 3.5% of GDP. Today it's 20, 21% of GDP. So it's grown by many factors, right? They start out small, but then they grow. And the values that kept them small kind of dissipate. And my argument is that the reason that happens, it's a causal reason. And the reason is philosophy. The reason is fundamentally morality. And the challenge, the reason America went from being a small country and today, the small government, and today this unlimited government that we have today, is because the founding fathers built a, what I believe is a magnificent political system on quicksand. And the quicksand was their ethics. They were conventional in ethics. If you ask them what was the, what was moral, they would say sacrifice, selflessness. That's what they would say. And that ethic undercut the political structure and destroy it. If you have a culture that actually accepts a morality of self-interest, a morality based on the principles of reason and self-interest, then it won't, it will reinforce, it won't undermine. And again, the immigrants, I'm all for immigrants, but the immigrants brought a continental philosophy to this country from Europe, which undercuts the, the very foundations of what this country was founded. That's just a reality. And the only challenge, the only thing we can do to save it, the only thing we can do to change it, is advocate for a different philosophy, a different set of ideas. Not just economics, but philosophical ideas, moral ideas, ethical ideas, to challenge the conventional. Yes? You beautifully described how our minds are getting enhanced by the Steve Jobs yeah. and Bill Gates. Yeah. And I endorse all of that. 
the planes that we fly in now that I can fly around the world. By the way, I do remember we didn't do that. <laughs> yes. Not that long ago. That's true. Because it was so expensive. Uh, would you care to, I don't know what you call moralize or what? The evil, you spoke of evil. There is evil in this world and it is bound to be They are using what Bill Gates gave us and what Steve Jobs gave us by and the aeronautical engineers flying planes are uh, recruiting new ISIS. Yep. So you want to uh, you want to you shift the foreign policy, which will only get me in trouble. So you won't believe it. So I don't do political predictions. I have no idea. If I think you will win, but I don't know. But let me just say this, and, and I'll say it briefly because I, I really don't want to get into a policy discussion. Um, the role of the government is to protect, the role of the American government is to protect the lives and property of Americans. And their job is to do whatever is necessary to protect the lives and property of Americans. And when America is attacked, their job is to destroy those who attack us. And I'll end it there. If you want, there are plenty of videos of me talking about foreign policy online. Yes. Um. It seems like to me that, that freedom has always been somewhat of an illusion because there is a force over which we have no control, right? Uh, it turns out, I think, that we're all going to die. Um, you know, that's what scientists show. Sure, but freedom has nothing to do with death. But, no. but, if capitalism is to be a moral system, surely it must be rooted in our mortality. Yeah. So, within capitalism as a moral system, what is the role of death. How does death shape the, the morals? No, that, that's good. Um, yeah, big, big, big. What's that? Because, yes, it's going to get away with that. <laughs> Which is right. So, so mortality tells us that you've got one shot at this. You've got your 70, 80, 90, maybe one day out, maybe some of these kids 120, 130 years on this earth. And that's it. There's nothing else. And I truly believe there is nothing else. So make the most of it. It's about this world. It's about making this world the best life that you can live. Living the best life that you can live. And then the question is, what political system allows me to do that? Allows me to take that? Because think about if we were really immortal. If we never died, right? And nothing could kill us. We wouldn't care about anything. <laughs> it's hard to have values when nothing can harm you. The source of values at the end is this fundamental choice that all human beings face. All living being based of life or death. And you better wait to make the right choices in life. And what government does, what statism does, is it constrains the choices that you make. It constrains the values that you can pursue. Instead of leaving you free to choose the values you think will make your life the best, you think will lead to the longest, best, most flourishing life that you can live. So I prefer freedom in the sense of no coercion, no force applied to me in my choice of values to try to make my life the best life for me. That makes sense? Well, like it's a little bit how capitalism Oh, well, capitalism is a system. And the way I would define capitalism is a system in which we ban coercion from human interaction. So we allow people to be free to make those choices rather than a government that constrains our choices. Or a gang, or a tribe, or whatever the constraints are. I want people to be able to make those choices. Yeah, the guy in the beard. Yes. So you uh, used um, per capita income as a measure of improvement of a society or a country. One measure. Okay. Uh, I, I was just curious to hear your comment on income inequality measures that are. Uh, especially in a lot of these countries that you gave an example of as moving away from socialist systems to capitalist systems, especially so, China and India. Yeah. Um, so you I mean, want to my comments on income inequality? Yeah, I mean, do you completely dismiss them or in, in, in cases where they show that it has increased? Yeah. Or, yeah, I mean, I, I so, mean so let me, let me do it. Let, let's put India and China aside for a minute. I'll come back to them. Um, 300 years ago, what was income inequality in the West? Almost non-existent. We were all poor. Yeah. <laughs> There's no income inequality. A few aristocrats up here, everybody else is poor. What did capitalism in the 19th century, the Industrial Revolution, create? Created vast amount of wealth, and at the same time, 
what happened? We got income inequality. Income inequality went from being flat like this to being like that. That is, everything went up, but some people went up much faster than other people. Why did they go up much faster than other people? Because they produced more, they created more, they had more value to trade. I think income inequality is wonderful. It's a sign of progress. It's a sign of success. It's a sign of value creation. We are not equal in anything except one thing. We're equally free. We equally have rights. We're equal before the law. That's all the same principle. But we have different skills. We have different abilities. And to the extent that we exercise those abilities, there's absolutely no reason we should be equal in outcome. But then, uh, but then you're also claiming that everyone is equal, equally able to rationalize, make the best decisions. Isn't I mean I? I no, I'm I saying I'm not saying because I know that's not true. I know a lot of people who don't make the right decisions, and I know they don't make the right decisions all the time. Why should I be penalized because somebody else doesn't make the right decisions? Because the only way to achieve equality is by penalizing people with the ability who made the right choices for the sake of people who made the wrong choices. Or, or don't have ability. I'll give you an example. You might think it's a silly example, but it's an example. I want equality of basketball. I want to be able to go on a court with LeBron James and be equal to him in basketball. And if you've seen me play basketball, you know that ain't happening. So what do we need to do? How do we create equality of basketball? Yeah, you have to break his legs and with me play, break one of his arms as well. <laughs> but that's the point. The point is LeBron James, yes, he was born with some skill, with some with good genetic makeup to make you good that, but he worked damn hard. He made the right choices in his life and he deserves everything that he gets. I didn't have any of that. I don't deserve it. And I certainly don't have a right to break his legs in order to make me feel good. So you, for whatever reason, didn't get the education, you didn't apply yourself, you maybe even didn't get the right genes, right? That doesn't give you a right to my stuff, which I did create, which I did work hard for. What right do you have to break my legs? You don't have a right to break my legs. And taking my money is much more damaging than breaking my legs. I get 50% of my income taken from me every single month. 50% of my income is 50% of my time, 50% of my effort, 50% of my life. I would rather you broke my legs. <laughs> Give me the 50% back. You don't have a right to break the bond changer's legs, and you don't have a right to reach people's money. So the only way to establish equality of outcome in any realm is to destroy the able. It's to destroy those who have. And yes, I'm not saying that those who don't have uh, are bad in any sense. Some of them are, but some of them are not. People work hard and some don't have the ability to become rich. So what? It's not about money. What is that? There's a comment you didn't expect from me. <laughs> <laughs> it's not about money. It's about the values you pursue. You can be, you can be very poor and happy and proud and having achieved something. And you can be rich because you're a crook and you'll feel lousy about your life. Uh, a, a good friend of mine describes that his grandfather, he, he, he became a CEO of a bank, the, the friend of mine, but his grandfather was a bricklayer. And he made not, almost nothing. But you know what? He laid those bricks. He made an income. He paid for the food on the table. He paid for his kids to get an education. He earned it. He felt pride. He was happy. It's not about the money. I love teaching. If you have noticed, I enjoy this, right? <laughs> I've got a PhD in finance, I could have gone to Wall Street. I'm willingly giving up millions of dollars in order to do this. Because I love it. Because it's not about money. It's about love. Capitalism is a system of love. <laughs> <laughs> Can you respond to the comment, you didn't build that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, you didn't build that as very deep philosophical roots. And, and the philosophical roots, at least in modern times, are John Rawls, theory of justice. 
<coughs> and the idea of John Rawls is you didn't build it because you didn't do anything. It's your genes and your environment. You are a product of genes and environment. That's what you are. So you, if you are only a product of your genes and environment, it's not yours. And it's crucial for the left to make that argument. Because if you didn't build it, then we can take it from you. It's not really yours. And if it's only genes and environment, then it's not really yours. Now, I happen to think there's a third factor more important than genes and environment. Choice. It's called free will. Free will. It's called choices that you make. And that's why it's yours. Um, you didn't build it as other factors. For example, you know, Obama tells us that, and by the way, this is an idea created by or really popularized by Elizabeth Warren, well, well before Obama. But it tells us that you, you drive on, on roads that were paid by the government, so you owe the government something. Well, where the hell did the government get the money to pay those, road, pay those roads? Not by taxing me over it. I paid for them over and over and over again. Uh, he tells you that, uh, that you have employees, you didn't do it alone. Absolutely. I, I, I have employees, you guys have employees, right? And what do you do with employees? You pay them. So you pay for everything you've gotten from them. It's a trade, just like the iPhone. They are better off for it, and you're better off for it. Um, he tells you you had a great English or some teacher in your past that you should owe a debt to. And maybe that's true. And if any of you have a great teacher in your past that did profoundly impacted your life, you should go back, find the teacher, thank them, and if you've got a lot of money, write them a check. <laughs> it's not the government's job to do it for you. Justice is not social. Social justice is a contradiction in terms. It's an it's a, a, a abomination. Justice is personal. You have a sense of justice towards a teacher, go and take care of it. Go and say thank you. Thank you is, a, is an act of justice when somebody does something good for you. So you didn't build it as crucial in this campaign around inequality to be, you know, uh, Piketty, the inequality guy, wants 80% marginal income tax rates and a 10% wealth tax. Well, to justify that, you have to first get the American people to believe that you didn't build it, because then we can take it away. So it's part of a campaign around inequality. Yes, he's been jumping. Uh, <laughs> I want to save my question in song form. Oh, no. <laughs> Is it going to be brief, though? Yes. You live in a bubble, so why live in a bubble? You think, you think, you think, you've got it all you've got from the whole works. So if you really believe that, why do you be here in Colorado? How did so, the Congress get what was theirs? How did they get what was theirs with the gun? With the gun? With the gun? With the gun? So I have no idea what the question was. Go ahead. As the Apache, Whose land this was? If you really believe that you shouldn't be breaking LeBron, LeBron James's legs because because you don't have enough skill, what about the colonists who come over who didn't have land to practice their own beliefs, but then decided that they can take it from other people just because they needed it? So first of all, <laughs> so first of all, that's irrelevant. <laughs> 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 No, it's got to racism. Even if I agree with you that they had no right to it, it's irrelevant to the question of whether capitalism is good or capitalism is bad. Because it's not capitalism that's stole. Stealing is banned by capitalism. Capitalism doesn't approve of stealing. So to the question of whether capitalism is moral or immoral has nothing to do with the indigenous Indians that were here. Now, it does have to do with what do we mean by pop? What? They're still here. They're not... Past well, but a lot of them are not, unfortunately, because we killed them. We killed a lot of them. I thought that was your point. Your point was that we killed a lot of them, which is tragic. A lot of bad things happened in the 19th century with the way America treated Indians. America did a lot of bad things. Slavery. Horrific thing, right? I'm not trying to justify the history, every element of the history. The question before us is not were the Indians treated well or badly? The 
question before us is, is capitalism as a system of freedom, of property rights, a just system or not? Mm -hmm. And nothing you said contradicted that. Now, I don't know what you mean by a bubble. I don't know what bubble I live in. Um, Look around you. This is Colorado, older Colorado, everyone. It's white and middle class. You have no idea what other people. But I didn't grow up white and middle class. I grew up in the Middle East, where, where people try to kill me constantly. What bubble did I live in? That's bizarre. So many people. My wife's not white. My wife doesn't know anything. I mean, it's a, it's, it's, it's a ridiculous assumption you always get when people disagree with you. They make you into a racist. I mean, that's ridiculous. I've said nothing racist throughout the talk. And my life is the exact opposite of that. I've not lived in a bubble. I'm an immigrant to this country who came with nothing. But fine. Yes. Could you um, tell us about your experience of capitalism? I haven't met anybody who's anti-capitalism, but everyone seems to. No, oh, everybody's again. Everybody's I anti. I mean, we're in Boulder, Colorado. Most of the people outside this building are anti-capitalist. <laughs> <laughs> So, how did it seep into the Oh, why? How, how did we? How did the culture become anti-capitalist again? I think it was always there in the background because the moral code, the selfless, the, the moral code of selflessness, is fundamentally anti-capitalist. So even when we had some capitalism, it was seeping in through that. But if you ask me, how did we take this big leap in the beginning of the century? So I think it's primarily because we imported. Uh, German Romantic philosophy into the United States in the late 19th century, early 20th century. We imported it in two ways. If you were wealthy in the United States and you wanted your kids to get the best education in the world, you sent them to Europe. And they came back with Hegel and Kant and, uh, and Marx and everything else. And if you were Princeton and Yale and Harvard and you wanted to become internationally renowned university, the best universities in the world, you hired the best professors from Berlin and from Paris and from Hamburg, and you brought them into the United States. And it's those ideas, those continental, uh, I believe Kantian ideas in the end, Kantian ideas that I think have seeped into the culture in many, many ways and have undermined uh, capitalism. So I blame the Germans. Don't mention the war. Have the not allow them no, I mean, this is like, this is why it's an intellectual battle. I'm not, in spite of my critics, I'm not for fighting, I'm not for guns, I'm for debating. Why I do this? I do this because I care about the world. I, I said capitalism is about love. My philosophy is a philosophy of love. I want the world to be the best world that it can be because I want to live in a world like that. I want my kids to live in a world like that. I do this because I love mankind and I love life. And I'm trying to intellectually change the world. That's the only thing, the only tool we have is reason. We're not going to win this with guns. We're going to have to win the debate, the argument, the discussion. That's what it's about, right? And, and, and for that, we need, to, we need uh, to speak and speak and speak, and we need to write and we need to read. And read, read Ayn Rand. <laughs> This is a one more question. Would that be all right? <laughs> sure. And then, are you busy on getting around your talk? Yeah, I'll stick around if anybody wants to ever ask. You brought up uh, the wealth of nations and the wealth of land and the quotes, your books. Yes. Uh, besides those, what were the most significant books to start a nation? Well, in my view, the greatest economist who ever lived was Ludwig von Mises. And I would encourage people to read him. It's not easy to read. You have to be motivated and interested. Um, if you read Wealth of Nations, uh, not Wealth of Nations, uh, Human Action, I would personally skip the first few hundred pages. Um, the Prexology part, I go to the economics, which, which, which is, he's, he's a genius. He's the best <coughs> that's ever lived, I think. Uh, and, and generally, I would follow the, the Austrian School of Economics. Although I also like some some uh, Chicago economists, there's certain things about Friedman I like, and certainly today there are people like John Cochran from the University of Chicago, <coughs> Kevin Rooney from the University of Chicago, who have, who have blogs, who I would follow. Um, but you know, beyond that, um, there's a lot of good political thinkers out there. There's a lot of good um, uh, economists out there. There's not a lot of good philosophy, unfortunately. Um, you know, in, in today I would, I would meet Tara Smith uh, from the University of Texas in Austin, who has a, who has a, a position there in the philosophy department. Um, you know, there's a, I, I generally I would I would urge you all read read read.
reason. Now, if you want to read a really, particularly the first few chapters, read the rational optimist. Because he, in, a, in the first few chapters, he has this great illustration of how human life has improved over the last 300 years. And just he does it in simple terms that anybody can understand. It's called The Rational Optimist by Matt Ridley. And it's, 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 it's very good. I mean, I, one is off after the first few chapters. The first few are very um, like Matt Ridley and the law. Yeah, the law by Bastiat, anything Bastiat did. So that, there's a lot of literature out there. Um, that, that, that supports the case for freedom uh, and supports the case for freedom here and everywhere in the world. Thank you all.